Hey, everybody. Wow. <laughs> that might be two streams in a row that we didn't do a big jagged drop. Mic drop at the, at the outset here. Uh, hey, everybody. I see people chiming in. Ed and Shane and Joe. And man, this is like, uh, did, anybody old enough to remember Romper Room when they would do the... No, probably not. Probably just, probably just me. Anyway, um, so I want to thank BB Ninja for being here. Um, uh, although I, I didn't see him in the chat. I, I don't know where BB is. B, I know where he is. He's supposed to be in Switzerland. Uh, he's supposed to be moderating for us today. But we're a very, we're a very well-behaved group. So I think we're probably safe. I'm very excited today because we've got um, Sean Tubbs joining us. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to bring him in in a minute here. He's in the green room. I can see him. Um, he didn't, he didn't know what that intro was, but I, I've talked to him about it before. One of the reasons I've been such a Sean Tubbs fanboy for years is the quality of the writing of the stuff he builds for these demos. Um, he's, it's just amazing. And that actually was a piece of music that he wrote that he did a bunch of stuff on a DGT that was sort of simulating pedal steel, which it still just gives me chills um, when I listen to that, which is why I dropped it on there. Um, and uh, for the J-Rock Alien Echo, I, I, he'll, he can tell us if maybe it's like eight or uh, no, five, six years old, maybe. Anyway, that you can't even get those pedals anymore. Uh, I've had a lot of questions lately about uh, best home amps. And this is always, I probably do one of these shows every year on best home amps. I'm only going to talk about the ones that I've had. And you guys that have been following the channel for a while know that I do um, periodically do a just one amp. And I have this sort of semi-academic quest to find an amp that's great at home, but you could also gig it. Um, and, and over time, people have teased me that it's slowly become like a, you know, five watt world became a 10 watt world, became a 20 watt world, became a 35 watt world. So we'll talk about, I'm going to talk about that. So the format today is to go through the amps that I've used in the last couple of years, few, three, four years, actually, um, in that role. Some of which I just got actually, um, like the line six stuff. But one of the reasons I thought of Sean was that one of those amps, as you all know, uh, two of those amps actually are the Rev D20 and the G20. Um, so those are those two amps that I've always enjoyed those. And I always think that two opinions are better than one. And Sean has a breadth of experience um, in on stages and in studios and stuff that I'm never going to have. So he can talk about sort of what is uh, volume, what's usable volume. Um, I will use the term speaking volume instead of the term bedroom volume or living room volume. I, I have a pretty big living room, big open space in the other room. So what would be volume in there is very different than like this little studio room, which is, you know, nine by 12. So what would be volume in this space versus what's volume in a space that's 25 feet deep um, is very different. So I, I always talk about it as speaking volume. Um, one of the many, many things I love about the guys on that pedal show is that they put, put the dB meter. Now it's behind them, so I don't know how accurate it is. I think we could all assume that, you know, the speakers are blowing forward and the dB meters back there. So it's probably blunted or muted somewhat, you know, padded down a little bit. Um, but you, when you see them talking or like the volume that I'm talking at now, um, I even looked it up. They say that that's between 55 and 60 decibels, right? The interesting thing is, that they say that anything above 70 decibels in a prolonged environment um, can cause ear damage. So we're really talking about trying to find that sweet spot where we like the sound of the amplifier, we like the feeling of the amplifier that's between um, our speaking volume and a volume where we can actually feel the air moving for our guitar and stuff. Um, but before I do any more, let me bring Sean in because um, Sean will have a lot to add to this conversation. So yeah, there he is. Hey, what's thanks for on? doing this, John. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so did, did Dario get a? Did you get a real big kickback for that T-shirt today? Uh, <sighs> <no>. <laughs> are, are you a Dario artist at least? I I am. I right. I, I got in with them. Uh, you know, when I was touring with Carrie all those years. Okay, and they funny. don't know that you're not doing that now. You just kept that on the download. Yeah, I just yeah, I just they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, it's like I I toured with I worked with Carrie for four years before I even approached Dario about it. Yep. And uh, it was Tom Spalding. He was like, "You're kidding me." You're you mean like you've, now, been, you've like, been doing you've been out on the road yeah, and you didn't tell us? You've been taking your own strings out. And he's like, "How long you been playing Dario?" And I was like, "I don't know how long has Dario existed." <laughs> right. When did I start playing guitar? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Right. Right. Yeah, they're still definitely my favorite strings. And now you know, the shirts just happened because this one was clean. <laughs> 
Oh, I used to work on campus, um, on campuses. Inevitably, there'd be some student with a college sweatshirt on. Mm-hmm. And I stopped doing it finally. After like 10 years of doing it, I would say, hey, I, I, I went, used to work at Ithaca College. And they they look at me like they had no idea because they didn't even know what they were. And they, then they go, oh, yeah, this was laying on the floor of my room. I think it's my roommates, you know. <laughs> Musicians and yeah. students. Well, it's the same things thing. like this. My daughter, she goes to MIT. And every once in a while, I'll wear, you know, she gets me like MIT shirt and stuff. But yep. you'll be like, you go to MIT? And it's like, no, my name is Tim, <laughs> at least in the mirror. <laughs> Wait, what, what the shirt say? It doesn't say Tim? Yeah, my re- my reaction to that would be like, if you think I went to I go to MIT, you don't know me very well. Yeah, you've obviously <laughs> never heard my use of the English vernacular. <laughs> exactly, right, right, right. <laughs> or what's the old uh, Steve Martin thing? Some people, I'm um, not even going to get the joke right. Uh, some people have a way with words, and some other people not have way. This is what <laughs> exactly, I remember That's that joke. Right. Uh, we <laughs> and I do remember Romper, Romper Room. Room. You're you're so you do remember Romper Room? Oh yeah. Oh, dude. Oh man, just aged myself. That's good. So we have, we have some top chat already. Robert Stewart, uh, thanks for that, Robert. We really appreciate it. And Alt Grendel, I can always count on the Grendel. Um, love mm-hmm. that. I love that online name. Uh, Embry Smith, uh, you know, says Tubbs get a haircut. Yeah, I was going to take up top chat for uh, a haircut for Sean because I think it's gotten away from him. And and I'm I'm a guy. So when I I was let's see I was fifth grade, my parents let me grow my hair and that was it. And I grew it like way, I mean, it was 1972. I grew it way down on my shoulders. Um, I think I was still wearing the shirt though. Um, and, and, and I grew it way down. And it was like that until I got like a Jackson Brown. I mean, I thought it was a Jackson Brown haircut. It probably didn't look like that. Uh, it went in my <laughs> teen years, but that's what I yeah. believed I looked like. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, when I uh, when I met my wife of 26 years, I, I had hair down to my hips <laughs> and then I cut it off, you know, super, super short. And it's always been short. I've always just cut it myself. All those hairstyles I had I yep. just did it myself. And uh, and I don't know. I just decided, you know, I'm just going to let it go. Yeah. Before it, you know, starts falling out. I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy let it, my habit. Yeah. Let it run for a while and see what so, happens. But it drives me nuts. I wanted I wanted you to talk about. A uh, couple things that you don't, because I don't have a sense of this. So, talk about what you think of as sort of room volume. You're in a. You told me you're in a bonus room at your house. Mm-hmm. So, what you think of as like you know bedroom or whatever home volume is. But I'd like to hear from you about like what kind of stage volumes you dealt with, and then what kind of volume you have in a studio. Like even if you're in an ISO room or those, just really quickly as a sketch to give people a sense of you know the variety of what uh, you know room volume is. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, you made a really good point about room volume, and I think it is smart to say uh, speaking volume. Um, for me, that's what it is. If if I can speak comfortably to somebody while I'm playing, mm-hmm. that's what I would consider like a, a room volume. Maybe maybe a little hotter, maybe a little softer, but that's where I consider like a. That's what I would consider room volume or speaking volume, and then. You know, if it's sessions with ISO cabs, you know, I'll, I'll have the amp set on stun. So that's the other extreme where, you know, I'm, I'm not, well, I'm not even thinking about decibels. I'm listening right. to what's happening on the mics. I want the amps to wake up if it's a hundred watt amp, you know, or even a 40 watt amp, I really want to push it. And then uh, the in-betweens are, yeah, you're playing on a, you know, maybe a club stage. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what people don't realize is, you know, is this loud enough to play with a band? And and the f- first question I always want to ask is, how loud does your drummer play? Right. You know, it, if your drummer, you know, if you can visualize with your ears, that sounds so stupid. But if you can hear and think about what's it sound like when the drummer cracks a snare, mm-hmm. you need to be able to be at least with or above that for a small stage volume. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got monitors, you've got all kinds of other things. You know, when I was touring with Carrie, we were never not on in-ears. Oh, But wow. see, that's a whole other conversation because the I think the biggest mistake guitar players make with in-ears is trying to feel in their skull what they, what they want to feel at the back of their legs from an amp. And boy, is that a mistake. I, I probably four years in figured out, oh, that's a mistake. You know, mm-hmm. don't don't play that way find other ways to to drop in the pocket and feel right um 
but even then, you know, uh, first two tours, uh, we had, uh, yeah, same thing. ISO cabs, uh, you know, amps mic'd up and I had them on stun. Yeah. You know, I had this, uh, when I had my, uh, my jazz quintet, the drummer was a college student when they I initially put the band together. So he'd have a gig cause he was an amazing drummer. He's a senior, but we would do these cocktail party gigs. And he always fell for this. I'd say, Hey, Brian, uh, I'd give him, you know, like money. I'd give him cash. I'm like, Hey, go get, go get beers for the band. And he'd mm -hmm. leave and I'd take his sticks away and he'd come back and all it would be, there would be brushes, maybe some yeah. bundles. If I was feeling charitable, maybe some bundles. He'd be like, Oh, you got me again. But yeah. for every time, you know, free beer. Take yeah. his sticks away. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever works, man. <laughs> it worked. It worked. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through and I'm going to, I've encouraged Jeff, uh, Jeff, right. Encouraged Sean to interrupt like Jeff and I were doing to each other yesterday, hand over fest when I was on Jeff's <laughs> stream. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about the amps that I've played the last couple of years. Um, and the ones that I've been sort of looking for this at home, you know, but you could actually take it out and gig and and you know what that means and um so i'm gonna go through these amps and then we're gonna spend some extra time for obvious reasons we should probably do the sean tubbs works for rev disclaimer moment now yeah yeah i do work for rev <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did it there yeah so, uh, actually, it's, so it's interesting i i played that music of yours on the clip and i've been a fan of yours for a long time and the reality is i completely separately reached out to rev not knowing that you had done the IRs in the D20, because I was just really uh, enchanted by the idea that they had this little tiny head that was 20 watts and at the same time had had the two notes and stuff embedded because I was using the two notes stuff already. And, th and there you were. And then later I found out that you'd actually kind of over time, they were like, that was really great. We should work more together. And you're like, I would work more together, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's been really fun. I mean, that whole thing was, was uh, you know, very just kind of organic. It just kind of uh, happened. Yeah, I guess well, those guys. Were amazing. It was just so kind of a natural flow, you know. Right. So we'll spend quite a bit, a little time on the D20, G20, yeah. and um, I'm right on target here. So okay. So so the thing, the amps that I've had the least amount of time, I'm going to do these sort of in financial order, from starting with a Line Six Catalyst 60, which is a full-on modeling amp that's 60 watts of solid state turned all the way up, and we'll. I'll get Sean to give his opinion. My general opinion about solid state versus tube volume is I look for double the solid state volume to semi act like tube volume. So a 60 watt solid state amp might be as loud as a 25 watt, you know, uh, tube amp. And I don't know the physics of that. I, I should spend the time call David Allen or somebody at some point and really learn that, but I haven't yet. Um, I will tell you that I've been playing these for a couple of weeks now. Um, and I'm, I, I'm I'm a little bit of a Line Six fanboy because I just think that the future technology stuff is fascinating, and uh, but at the same time, um, when Jeff and I were working on the Stomp preset pack for um, the uh, the tones of Eric Clapton, we were talking to people at Line Six about which models um, really stand out. And for example, like the Park Seventy Five amp at Line Six is a particularly good one as opposed to like the J, the um, J1045 that they have. It's just not as, those are all different. And the park one they have is just killer. The funny thing was that Jeff worked at line six years ago and he actually had played both those amps. He's like, oh yeah, that's a fire breathing dragon. And the other one is just not as, you know, cream at the Fillmore as the park amp is. So, yeah. so when we were talking, when I was talking to the guys at line six about the catalyst getting shipped, um, they're like, we know you like box, you know, hot rotted box tones. So as soon as you get it, dial it to boutique. The boutique is built on a matchless H HC30. And, and oh, okay. I've, I've got a pair of them here and I've got one dialed with the Fender Blackface as a clean cranked up on the edge. And then the other one is a boutique matchless and they're great. I am going to set them up for a future stream. I've got, I was working with Jeff earlier today and God help you all. I'm going to play some guitar where you'll actually hear those uh, catalysts coming out towards you, but not today. Uh, Cause I got a real guitar player on the show, but. Um, oh, come on. But uh, well, as you, uh, Sean very, very courteously earlier said, we are all real guitar players. I guess he, yeah. I guess he's being existential that we're here <laughs> and we have guitar anyway. So, so the Catalyst 60 is the new one and it actually goes down to a half watt. I wouldn't say it's a half watt and then it's got a 30 watt setting and a 60 watt setting. My experience so far is the half watt setting is really it's a it's a distortion pedal at that point. 
So I, I'm not looking for it to do the high gain thing or even the Marshall setting. There's, I think, 11 amps in there, but I'm really just using the two so far. And I'm trying to treat it like a pedal platform with an HX effects in front of it. The idea being to make a very light, they weigh 27 pounds. So it's pretty, it's pretty light. And I actually, I'm going to change out the speaker to a Neo to see where that goes. Um, the next category, which actually is the amp that I always recommend when people say, what should I do for at home? And I ask them what their budget is. Um, I think that the one of the best home budget amps is a Vox AC10 C1. The Vietnamese, you can get those for about $400 used all day long. I used to have a pair of them. They sounded great. Um, you change out the power tubes. Um, amazingly, you don't have to change out the speaker. The speaker they used actually sounds good. And you go through the forums and you'll see that people swap them out for greenbacks. Not all the speakers fit, but the the little greenback does fit. It's not an improvement. They, they sound incredible. And I actually think that at lower volumes, because of that sort of uh, glassy thing that Voxes have, um, there's a there's a presence in the room at speaking volume that like a scooped Fender doesn't have. Um, mm. uh, and I, I really love those. I think they're great little amps. And this is where I'll remind everybody, because we're going to talk about Fenders next and Champs and those kinds of things. And Sean and I were talking about this before we started. Um, so wattage is dependent on volume how much you've got it turned up, how much wattage you're asking, asking the amp to do. Is it dependent on voltage? And as you turn it up, you're feeding more voltage. So we're going to talk when we get to the second half of this, where we talk about how do you get closer to these things at speaking volume with different amp sizes, because this would be something that Sean knows a lot about. And we're going to talk about his tilt pedal in regards to that too, because that, I think that's a great pedal for that kind of job. But I'll remind everybody that if you're at speaking volume, you're probably living in a two to three watt world maybe four or five watts tops world. And then you've got the amp turned up, but you probably got your guitar turned down. Otherwise, it's just too loud. It's going to be way louder than you could talk. Nobody's going to be able to have a conversation. So all of these amps that we're talking about, you're probably dealing with a you know two, three, four, five watt world um, all the time. So it's very on brand for the channel to talk about it that way. We are going to talk about the advantages of turning the amp up and turning the guitar down as a way to get more full We'll, and we'll come back to that because I'm sure that's something, like I said, that Sean talked a lot about. So AC10 C1 is one of my favorites. I have this set up on my screen, so I can't see comments, guys. So I apologize. Um, I'm sure Perry's telling us to get 100 water and dial it back. But we'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> um, so then so let's talk about Fender. So the, um, uh, the only downside of the AC10 that I will say is going to be true about the Fenders as well. There's no mid-range control. You got trouble in bass. So you can't sculpt the mid-range and the mid-range has a lot to do with both what we hear, the frequency we hear and the frequency that defines guitar. So the ability to sculpt your mid-range has a lot to do with how flexible the amp is, but also how loud you can make it sound in the room um, in, the, in the frequencies that you're gonna want. And so that along with champs, even my boutique, I had a boutique champ that had a mid-range control on it. Uh, my big verb from FYD amps, um, so champs, Princeton's and deluxes, there's no mids. It's like the most common, um, mod where, you know, you go to an amp shop and they're like, yeah, I'm always putting mid range controls in this hole on the back, you know, uh, of, of a fender because that's to be able to do that. Zach Childs, who's a friend of both of ours, mm -hmm. Zach will tell you that his way to deal with that is immediately swap the speaker out for a Celestian. Absolutely. And I'm just going to add mids. And then if I want to bring the mids down, I'll just bring the bass and treble up. And by default, because of, you know, there, there, there is a, there is a control that's not variable. There's a resistor that's controlling the amount of mids that's coming through. And it's not variable because a pot is a variable resistor. So what you do is you bring the highs and lows up and it naturally scoops it. And then if you want to kind of roll them anyway, or it's the other way around, if you bring them up, you're going to get more mids because everything's coming through. Anyway, I, this I'm not the I'm not the amp tech that I might prepet, pretend to be. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the the I have two deluxe tone masters in the other room um, that might be going away now that these catalysts are here. But in each of those is a uh, cream back, is a, a neo cream back, and that really opened them up. Uh, I made a big difference. I will say because I think um, Jeff McElwain's office is saying when people say I need to buy an amp. Oh, well, what's your gig? Well, I don't have a gig. Buy a Princeton. Well, I have a little money. I, I, I'm willing to spend money. He's like, okay, buy an old Princeton. <laughs> mm -hmm. like, buy a really nice Princeton, you know? And then yeah. you've got an amp where all the pedal companies 
have been building pedals expecting that curve. Um, I've lost track of the number of pedal builders that I really love. And they're like, well, I'm expecting the world to have fenders. So what I've got on the bench is an old deluxe. And that's what I test mm -hmm. with. You know, mm -hmm. I, I plug them into a Marshall two or a box, but really it's all about that fender curve. That's really mm -hmm. what that's about. Um, yeah. So a, a, a Princeton or a deluxe. Now, now we're getting into the range of whether or not you might be able to gig it. The Princeton's all about how great your sound guy is and, you know, how, how many you carry. Um, I, guys in Nashville always often talks about talk about deluxes as being Zach will say this. I've heard John Bollinger say if the gigs if uh, what did John say in the in the Guthrie Trap interview? He says, if a deluxe won't cut, you're locked. The band is loud. Mm -hmm. But but it, to me, you know, I hear people like Jeff talking about 40 watts being a minimum to have headroom as a pedal platform. So around town there is is that just John and Zach, the gigs they're doing, or are they really kind of at, they've got their deluxes at six and they're riding the edge of breakup? What's what do you think? They're they're right on the edge of breakup for sure. Yeah. Um, that's why they always call it. You know, you always hear, hear guys in Nashville say, "I'm honking through a deluxe," and that's the thing. You're you're running it right at the edge of breakup, and it's it's loud enough. I mean, it's not going to be super like crazy efficient. But but those players are so used to dialing those amps that way um, that they, they do sound great. Um, there is the 40 watt if you want the headroom thing. If you want it to be super tight and clean, then you're going to have to you're going to have to run hotter than that, hotter than like a deluxe wattage. Right. But uh, yeah, your band is loud. Like if, if your deluxe gets lost, it's probably fairly that's a fairly loud band. Yeah. You know, on, on a, I would say a small to medium medium stage, you know, and I've, I've caught guys using Princeton's, um, you know, if the drummer's using blast sticks, you know, or rods. Yeah. I've caught guys using Princeton's that they put a 12 inch in and maybe had some tweaks done on them. So they're a little more efficient and it sounds great. Right. You know? Yeah. But yeah, the deluxe, yeah, the deluxe is kind of the, still kind of the Nashville thing as far as when someone, you know, you know, I want that, you know, black panel deluxe sound, even if yep. maybe they're not using a deluxe, they still tend to lean towards that as their pedal platform, grab and go, you know, get her done. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which is a good segue to the twenties. Mm -hmm. So like I said, I got, I reached out to rev uh, a long time ago. I, I, people have heard me say this before. I don't, I don't have sponsors on the channel that I, that, that come to me. I, I get emails all the time and I always just say, no, I, I find things in the marketplace that are interesting to me. And I reach out to them and I say, I'd be interested in, in trying this. And then if I like it, I'll talk about it on the channel. Um, and I don't do it very often, um, mm -hmm. but I reached out to Rev. The other thing I'm looking for is, and I was saying this to Sean earlier, I, I want to work with companies that are smaller companies and are responsive to musicians. And um, I remember when I wrote to Strandberg, I, I wrote, I wrote him an email and it was a busy time and I didn't get anything back. And then I wrote another email and said, I just want to follow up. You don't want to be a nag. And Ola wrote me back, Ola Strandberg. And I'm like, nice. okay, this is the kind of company that I want to deal with this, this level. So, yeah. um, so why don't you run us through like the D20 and whether, and sort of like, do you see it as having the same, obviously it's 20 Watts. So it's sort of in that deluxe territory. Yeah. Um, but of course the combination of uh, transformers is different. And um, do you think it's got as much grunt? I know the guys just did a, a live stream where they were comparing a D20 or a G20, I can't remember, and a, and a deluxe. That was just last night, right? Yeah. 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 That was, I think that was a D20 and a silver face. The okay. problem, that one had, I think that one had a bright cap. I think the 74s and ups, I think those have bright caps. Unless somebody but, uh, breathed on them, like almost everybody has. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, I, yeah, the, the D20 really, what I always tell people is if you like a black panel deluxe, a black panel fender really, but in the 20 watt, you know, I would say deluxe Princeton, even maybe a champ, if you like that, then the, the D20 is, is you're probably going to like the D20. I mean, it's, it's got the same, it's basically got, you know, the same iron. It's not like it's got these little tiny, you know, transformers in it. It's, it's, the real deal tube amp, it's six V sixes, six V six is just, there's a thing, at least in my humble opinion about the way six V six tubes breathe. Six V six tubes are not as one trick pony to me. Like if you crank a six V six, you know, this amp, especially it, 
it actually will get sounding a little British. It goes from this kind of American voice thing into more of a, like a British almost tonality just because of the way the 6v6s are reacting to the transformer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that the idea behind it was to build a really great sounding pedal platform amplifier that started, I mean, it's got some amazing technology on the back end, but it needed to start as a really great sounding pedal platform amplifier in that 20 watt range, 6v6 powered, you know, 12AX7 preamp tubes, all the right stuff. Um, and, and, you know, but with the mid control, the mid control is a big deal. It's a really big deal. And, and, you know, what you were talking about, I call it uh, mid perception and to a degree there, there's technical things that, that, that do happen when you turn uh trev and bass all the way up or trev and bass down, you know, you'll get more perceived mids if you turn the bass down. Okay. Usually what I'll tell people to do is like, uh, especially on like, if I'm working with a guy that's dialing pedals on a deluxe and they're just like, ah, I just want it to honk a little more. It's like, okay, turn the volume up a little bit, turn the bass down and then uh, almost treat your treble. Uh, it can almost turn into somewhat of a mid control and treble control. And you just kind of find that happy spot. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, I don't know, like Rick would know, there's cats that would know the difference between like something technically happening, like scientifically happening or ear perception. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm leaning more towards that your ears are going to perceive more mids if you don't have this billowing bass happening. Yeah. Um, but on the, yeah, on the rev, on the D20, yeah, you've got that mid control. And that's the nice thing is if you turn that thing all the way up on the majority of tube amps out there, if you crank the mids all the way up, it's also going to create gain mm -hmm. on the preamp side. So it's just, yeah, it's just a really, really nice feature. And, and I was not at all uh, upset when they said there was going to be a, a mid control on it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. important kids. Right. And, and I, we were talking about champs, how um, before we got started, how champs are really just three tubes. There's one preamp tube, a power tube, and a, and a rectifier tube. And I was saying mm -hmm. how much one tube makes a difference. So when I got my D20, I popped the top off to look at the tube complement. I was like, wow, this is this is a two gain stage, one preamp tube. And I immediately went to my little boutique pile of tubes and pulled out a, a late 50s Ampex Bugle Boy, dropped it in there, and it really opened it up. And I actually mm -hmm. said that on a stream or someplace. And, and I got a phone call or a text or email from Derek Acefell. It's like, we need to talk. I need mm -hmm. to know your experience with that. I was like, wait, this is the guy who runs the company. And he yeah. wanted to talk about my experience of running different boutique tubes, sort of, you know, new old stock tubes in that, because it is just one preamp tube. And anybody will tell you that plays a lot with tube amps that the first tube influences the amp the most. So it's everything upstream from there is colored by that first tube. So spend your money on the first tube. And then yeah. depending on how much breakup you want, maybe even up upstream from that, including the phase inverter. And, get the characteristic of breakup you want as it's sending the information on to the, the power tubes. But really that first tube, and especially in a D20. Now a G20 is two, two nine pin tubes, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and you know, but same rule kind of honestly applies. And I think it does with any tube amp, um, V1 position. Yep. If you're gonna change anything preamp wise, change that first and yeah, you'll hear the most difference and, right. then, and then go from there. And yeah, sky's the limit, and I'm sure uh, with that that particular tube, it was probably a completely different animal. It probably yeah. sounded killer. Yeah. This is very yeah. very cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, I'm going to say something that I think would surprise people. I had a D20 and a G20 both at the same time, and when I was reaching for something to play, just living, speaking volume, whatever you want to say, I would often reach for the G20 and push the wide switch in. Mm -hmm. To me, it, it was like the old loudness control on an old amplifier. It, you know, at a speaking volume, I don't know if it was really like the old loudness control would actually give you like a scoop curve and bringing bass and treble and kind of giving you some definition that you didn't have. It wasn't really raising the level so much. Yeah. Um, so, so, so I actually, I, I'm not a high gain player in the least, but I found the G20 to be a little more flexible for the extra hundred. To me, it was for, worth it for the wide control. Um, what do you yeah, think? well, that that wide that wide controls there, the wide switch, really to just make the amp sound a little bit more pushed, especially yeah. on the clean channel, because that wide switch is on on the big boy amps too, on like the one twenty, oh, 
Yeah, uh, on the clean channel. And it does. It'll, it'll just make everything sound a little more pushed and a little more dynamic. Huh. So once again, in this case, it goes back to perception. So you were running at a lower volume. Right. And you were basically able to just have the amp sound a little more pushed without getting louder. So it felt better. Because the thing with the G20 is the G20's voiced, I would say the G20's voiced more like the big guy amp, the 120 clean. So it's right. a little bit more efficient clean. Huh. Um, but but when you push that wide switch in, then it has this kind of, once again, kind of pushed tonality um, to it. Now, the difference like with the G or the D20 is, to me, that amp feels more, uh, I don't want to say compressed, but it has a natural sag to it that okay. is different than than the G20. Less, but, less immediate. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, that's, that's yeah. you know. That's what I love, but that wide switch is is it's magical. Really, yeah. honestly, at, at any volume, like, well, I'm contradicting myself because on I don't, I'm pointing over here. You guys can't see what I'm pointing at. I'm pointing at like a a, a rev, the uh, the generator 120, the four channel, and I don't use. I'm less apt to use that wide switch on that amp because the clean is already doing. Right. everything Massive. so if i turn that on it all it almost takes up too much room for me especially in a mix just sitting and playing it is glorious well but, see that uh, could be true about what i get from the g20 as well it could be that putting in that switch is this wonderful you know moment when i'm not in the studio and it's just playing for fun but if i was in a band context it might not work at all yeah it might take up too much space depending on right. what you're what you're doing but but they are you know they're similar i i would say the d20 is is more that black panel thing but the the G20 is a little bit more like the 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 Dan Trudeau Rev you know generator series clean. It's a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. Cool, very cool. We'll come back to that because I think the wide what you're saying about the wide switch is something we're going to talk about in running a boost at speaking volume mm -hmm. on a on an amp uh, mm -hmm. at speaking volume. We're going to come back to that and we're going to talk about the tilt because that's such a great version of that. So let me just. Finish off. You know, I skipped over the Vox Tone Master on the Vox, the Fender Tone Masters Deluxes. Um, I just touched on them. I, I do think those are amazing amps, and the the ability to dial the it has a lot more settings than the Catalysts do as far as different levels of uh, volume. And the thing that Zach Childs has one and he uses it as his backup for his, I think he's got a sixty five, and then he carries his Creamback um, Deluxe Tone Master as a backup. Um, and I will tell you that he did a gig where he was running a 64 Vox AC 10 that he has and a cream and his Neo is Neo cream back tone master. They, this is like, it's some big casino gig in Las Vegas. And he was running direct out of the back to the front of house. And he had the box mic'd. And then they came back from the break and they grabbed some food and it was enough of a break where it was kind of, you know, juggled going back and he played the whole second set and he went over to turn his amps off and he never turned the box back on. And Oops. he did one bit. <laughs> And, it, and wow. it, the thing was, he he wasn't in ears. He had, but he'd been able to have the amount of stage volume he wanted with that that power switch, you know, mm -hmm. where they're changing the model. And then the front of house guy was happy as anything because he's coming right off the XLR. Yep. So that's my tone master story, and I, I'll I'll give a nod to Zach with that story because I think that's an incredible testament uh, to. Yeah. The happy that worked on a gig. So mm -hmm. um, the last amp I want to talk about, the two amps actually, is that the last year um, I've been playing a Victory VC35. I sort of gravitated towards uh, more Vox style amps over the years. And the VC35 got my attention um, in the demos they did because of the versatility. I will say that I absolutely missed the embedded IRs. And I immediately, when they came out with the little you know, uh, power amp and tube amp, these little tiny guys they just came out with that has the two note emb embedded, I immediately wrote to their marketing guy and said, so you're going to put those in the lunchbox heads? And he's like, not currently the plan. I'm like, ah, it's a mistake. You got to do it. You know, anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's... you might be right. <laughs> yeah, it would be amazing. But the VC35 for me is Ben, and I've said it before, I'll just say it quickly here. Um, it's got an, it's got a switch like the D20, which will switch down to four Watts. This will switch down to 12 Watts. And now we're, now it's basically, I got a, I got a boxy kind of Princeton and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm back in the five Watt territory. The thing is it gives you treble middle base, and then it gives you a switch for a mace, a mid boost on top of that. So you can, sh you can kind of change the shelf of the mid 
and then dial it. And then there's a base, a base cut. So you can crank up the gain, cut the base back and then still dial it. It doesn't disengage the base swing. It just changes mm -hmm. how much effect your swing is doing. And okay. so you can actually I can get um, by, you know, scooping the mids, I can get a very black panel kind of sound. I can get the full on hot boxy sound. And because of the mids and because of what you were talking about, this is an EL84 amp. That's really a pretty short step towards Marshall territory if you can goose the mids and do that. And then, you know, if I throw like a Jetter 45, uh, 100 gold pedal in front of it, it's it's a full on full boat Marshall. Nobody would know what's in the back line. Um, yeah, yeah. Those amps are amazing. And I, I've never used it on a 30 um, at 35 watts. Uh, I haven't had to. Um, but I will say that, interestingly, I, I've heard and we talked about this briefly with Jeff and I saw Jeff's in the in the in the stream now. Uh, he's in the chat. Uh, he, I think he, he very subtly said, I have arrived, which is very Jeff. He's such a <laughs> roller. Anyway, um, so um, he was saying that um, 40 watts is sort of the beginning of the amount of dynamic headroom he wants because of the kind of player he is. He's rolling the plane back. We're going to come to that now. So um, and so, and actually Mick Taylor from that pedal show and previously from Guitarist Magazine had a had a hand in helping voice some of these amps and particularly the V40 and the V35. And he immediately said the other day that he doesn't feel like he has enough clean headroom. Like the amps get loud enough, but mm -hmm. what he wants is a really clean pedal platform, very, very clean. And he doesn't get it with that lunchbox. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't live in that world. You know, I'm not, I'm not having Andy Timmons sit in with the band like he yeah. did. So I can see how that would be a thing. So, um, and I, I skipped over some prices. I didn't have to do the fender prices for folks. The D20s are uh, 1299 for a D20 and they're 1399 for the G20. Yeah. Uh, and then the victories are running about 1499 for the VC35 for the head, the lunchbox head. There's a deluxe head as well. That's a hundred bucks or 200 bucks more. And then they have a, a combo that's 2000, it's 1999 for the copper mm -hmm. deluxe. And then when you go all the way to the deluxe, then you're getting tube driven tremolo, tube driven reverb, um, and, and I haven't touched those because I don't want to know. I'm sure they're great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'd be the perfect living room amp. Uh, yeah. So, so when we talk about playing at home, we got 20 minutes left. Probably should have done this the other way around, where we spent 20 minutes on the amps that I've enjoyed and 40 minutes or a whole hour on this. Um, the question is, so how do you take the amp that you have? I've seen a lot of people talking about, you know, their hundred waters in their living room or their Sir Badger or whatever they have in their living room. How do you have it not turned? How do you not have it too loud, but get to the feeling that you get? And the first thing I always say is um, start with a boost. Mm -hmm. So boost the front end, like what you were talking about with the wide switch. Get that first tube's attention by asking it to do a little more. Because if we talk about it this way, the a boost, a boost is basically adding a gain stage. It's just a mm -hmm. transistor gain stage to the front of the amp. And now you're sending more gained up signal, hotter signal to that first tube, which makes the tube work harder, which is mm -hmm. going to give you more harmonic content. Mm -hmm. And so, Absolutely. yeah, so talk, so put the, pull the tilt up and talk about it. Sean's got a signature pedal that he developed with the guys at Rev that has a boost circuit and an overdrive circuit, but the boost circuit is really unique. And I think in this, and you, especially people talking about like driving a champ, where the things start to come apart or even a Princeton, you know, where it starts yeah. to come apart on the low end, you, you dealt with that. So take us through it. Well, yeah. And there's, there would be a couple ways to use it. So we're, we're focusing on boost That's side. I've got things back and I'm looking, this, yeah. this is hard, this side. Um, the boost side of it can be used, uh, you know, to address what Keith was talking about where uh, the low end's falling apart. You can definitely use it for that, but also I've, um, I guess I could say coached guys um, on if they're wanting to play at lower volumes, but they want things to sound bigger and feel bigger, then you would actually go the other way. So um, if you, you know, have it all the way, you know, in this case to the right, that's going to be the most low end. So as you turn to the right, the tilt creates more lows, cuts highs, and then it's the opposite to the left. So I, I'll tell guys, look, you want to hit the tube a little bit harder, that first, just what you were talking about, V1 tube, but then go ahead and start where it's actually maybe adding a little bit of low end huh. and then just start kind of slowly rolling it back. Don't, don't cut anything. Don't use the cut switch. 
just mm. leave it in the center and see if you can get it to feel better. It should already feel just a little bit more uh, spongy and just bigger. Yeah. And then if you find like a sweet spot, I keep getting backwards. If you find like a sweet spot that's maybe here and all of a sudden it's like, okay, I, I love that, but it is just a little too much lows. Then you can go ahead and start employing the switch to just tame that without changing basically the stack, gosh, the stack that you yeah. created. And talk about or what the switch you, does. Sorry. So talk about what the switch does. Oh yeah. Okay. So the the switch on this is basically it's called a tight switch. So it's when it's in the center position, that's you know not touching anything. It all it's doing is I would say it's in maybe that hundred and something, maybe hundred and twenty hertz range. Uh, it, it'll just cut. So. The reason that exists is because on this side of the pedal, I wanted this to be able to drive this side of the pedal to create more saturation. And you know, when you boost into something that much, nine times out of 10, you're gonna get low end anomalies that are gonna be problematic. So there were two ways to do it. I wanted the tilt EQ in there to address that, but also to just give you a tone sculpting thing. But also what happens is you sculpt your tone. It's like, oh, that's perfect. Too much low end though. And if mm. I turn this way, now my top end is going to change. Mm. That's where the, the tight switch comes in. It's like you can cut just a little bit of lows mm -hmm. without touching this or maybe some more lows. And like for me, I'll cut more lows to actually do that perceived mid thing again. Mm. If I really want to bring out some more just perceived mid, then I'll, I'll use that. I'll employ that switch. But yeah, you can use this two ways. Uh, I would say if you want to run at bedroom levels, then yeah, you'll use the boost side of it to push the front end of the amp a little more, but then that tilt EQ is what's going to make things get bigger, more spread out. And, and the biggest struggle, and you guys can chime in in the comments, but the biggest struggle is really how it feels. You can, you know, sometimes the tone is okay, but it just doesn't, it's not breathing the way you want it to. And, and yeah, pedals like these, you can definitely do that. Another way to do it is, you know, you look at a pedal like, uh, maybe like that Greer or the Lightspeed. Sometimes it sounds really great to find a pedal that's super low gain. So you're just sending a little bit of clipped signal, just a yeah. little bit into the clean front end to once again, give it that kind of breathiness to that first, you know, tube. Could you, uh, could you dial the overdrive side of the tilt to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, and it's the same thing. Like I've, I've told guys, look, man, uh, you know, run the volume hotter, run the gain lower, uh, run the bass at noon and then adjust accordingly. And same thing with like the treble, run the treble at noon and you can definitely, and, and the, the thing with this side of the pedal is I did not want this pedal to be an amp in the box at all. It's not an amp in a box, but, but at the same time, I really wanted it to respond like a really great, uh, sorry, I keep getting it off camera. I really wanted it to respond like a really great single channel tube amplifier. Mm -hmm. So it's got just a little bit of what I call it's, you know, sag transformer sag, but it's not compressed. So if you want to go that route where once again, it's a feel thing, then yeah, run the gain lower, you know, or if you're wanting to take solos at low volume, then obviously turn the gain up. But um, this pedal is just crazy dynamic and would yeah. work, you know, right. wonders for that. Right. And I think that's, that's a perfect segue because one of the other, the other things that you get are the, the sense of harmonic content. So the well, first thing that everybody seems to say, and my one of my favorite pedals for doing this, besides that one, which is one of the reasons I thought to call you, and that one's really new. Um, I have a um, uh, a Rocket uh, ML, a Melody Drive, the Mark Latieri. Yeah, yeah. There, there you have got an EQ. So I've got all the sculpting capability for my mid perception stuff. At the same time, the the voicing of that pedal is someplace between a blue note and a dude, or a blue note and a um, you used to have it on your board, a, uh, it was like yeah. a Marshall, like a, um, well, you mean like a JTM 45? Yeah. Not like the, the 45, 45 caliber. Other one, the silver Archer. one with the red yeah. note. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Archer. Yeah. Cause to me, I, I think it really is essentially kind of an Archer with an EQ. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's a, he's got an Archer with an EQ. That's uh Steve Stevens. That's the, that, that's a Steve Stevens, but right. I think, 
Marx is is it's, similarly... he's together. Yeah, like yeah. Still into the same pedal. Anyway, yeah. so I use that, and I actually find that's great as a clean boost, or just what you said, where you're just dialing in just a little clipping to send it in. You know, yeah. into that that clean signal. It works great for that. Um, yeah. But the thing that still some people still miss is the sustain. And now we're back to talking about feel. And so um, I had in my notes, the, the, so people are like, well, I still don't have the feel I want. And everybody's feel is different. You know, I don't hit the guitar very hard. Um, I have a lot of friends hit the guitar really hard. I, I run, you know, like 11s on my acoustics and I, I'm not buzzing and stuff. Um, I've got, I do have 11s on that DGT, but I'm, most of my guitars are like nine and a half. So, um, so for me to add a little compressor that has a blend on it, is the other magic thing for at home. Like if, if I was a little pedal board for at home, it would have a compressor with a blend and it would have the um, some sort of an overdrive like the tilt where I've got a lot of control over dialing different tones with it. Um, the the compressors I always talk about are, um, David Barber's a good friend of mine. David Barber was the first one to put a blend on with the tone press yeah. like uh, yeah. 15 years ago now or something. And yeah. then everybody seemed to leave him alone for 10 years. And then all of a sudden blends ended up on everybody's uh, uh, things. If you want a really small one, I'd say the exotic SL is one that you see a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you're using, last time I knew you were using a Sir because you wanted your compressor to be a little more colored. If memory Yeah. Is that right? Honestly. Yeah. Because for me, uh, you know, what I was going to say immediately was like, yeah, get a compressor. Right. And that, that solves that at those volumes. But for me, I tend to lean into compressors because I need it to sound like a compressor. Right. And that, that was the thing. It's like, I, I want it to sound like I turned on a, a compressor, right. you know, for like a 12 string part. And, and because you can dial in brighter, you know, there's like a bright switch essentially on that thing. It, it works great. And I'm, I'm having a board built right now and that's, that's going on it. Um, yeah. Cause I was actually torn between that and the 1176 copy, the origin. Yeah. Is such a great, wow. What a great compressor. And I'm going to keep it. It'll, it'll definitely be something I keep. And I kept going back and forth, but I went right back to, but I use a compressor because I need it to sound like a compressor. Yeah, right. And then if I'm on a session and I want an LA 2A or 1176 kind of thing happening, then I'll use the Origin, you know, yeah. but that's, boy, that's a whole other program. Right, <laughs> well, right, exactly. But like you're saying, that's like, you want it to sound like it's a really compressed thing. You're always quick to say that you, you get so many calls for all that funk playing that they want you to do. Mm -hmm. So that's a joke folks so um yeah. uh, the but but you're in nashville so the idea that all of a sudden it sounds like you stepped on a mxr red box is a real yeah. thing that's a straight up yeah. thing right and then absolutely and it's also a workflow thing you know it's uh, you know my my 12 string is this cool kind of hamer newport 12 that i absolutely adore um and sometimes i need that thing to sound a little bit more like a ricky right so that once again the that compressor i can do that immediately yeah. workflow right you know that's a big part of it too but yeah sometimes i just want it to sound like that sound that i've heard on records immediately right so you know that's a big part of it cool wow we got through the the easy fixes at home um so let's see if we can get some questions i see that bb actually showed bb actually had some broadband problems where he was bb actually went through last summer we had a day where i was in the middle of the stream and a thunderstorm knocked out not just the internet, but the power at my house. So <laughs> yeah. Evie was left alone on the stream there answering questions, which he's completely capable of doing. As I was going to say, you know, if there was anybody to get left alone on that, it'd be him. That's right. Well, I had I had my whole intro with the BB thing, when, which always includes, um, here we are trying to stump BB again. Good luck with that. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Anyway, that's so let's see what we got for some questions here. Um, oh, so just nice, people saying nice things. Uh, Ed Reba from, used to be in um, media. He says he uses a real 1176. That's good. Nice. Yeah. Uh, That's Jeff pretty Mar big on your pedal board there, guy. <laughs> Ed's, a, Ed's a studio guy. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Macerlein says, just not that we need to say so, but Sean is a monster player. Uh, we covered that before before Jeff got here, Jeff. I appreciate you saying that again because it's absolutely wow. the truth. Right uh, back at you, Jeff. That's really sweet of you, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, Duke Frank is sitting here to say that he really likes the Weber speaker that they built specifically for the AC-10. Huh, I, I haven't tried that. I don't have an AC-10 now. Somebody asked uh, which which amps have gone away. Um, and I did a video about just one amp last year. And I people probably know I bought a house in January 
preparing for buying the house is a really good way to clean out your gear closet. Mm -hmm. And I did that last summer and I sold um, 11 guitars and 11 amplifiers and maybe 50 pedals that had accumulated since the beginning of the channel. Cause when I started the channel, it was the original channel was just all about minimalism content. And I had gone down to three DGTs. It's all the electric guitars I had three different ones, you know, an all mahogany one, a gold top, just because, and, uh, and the original 2009 that I had, uh, like I, like I said, you, you have, do you still have two DGTs? You have an, I a, do. A Derek, Derek has the, Derek's got one of them. And then the other one's a really early one. Yeah. Um, you're, I don't get out much. Matter of fact, my buddy Brian Oaks has it right now. And that one, that one's really early. That's back when they had the, uh, the finish issues. Oh, well, I didn't know they did. That there was a finish. Yeah, issue. there was early on. There was a bit of an issue with the nitro, and and the early one that I have uh, definitely, especially out on the road with Carrie, that reared its ugly head really quick. But I, I didn't care to be yeah, honest right. with you. And then the yeah, the second one I have, Derek's got it up at uh, up in Canada, and they're yeah, they're fabulous. But isn't that fair? Because isn't that Les Paul over your shoulder? His? Yeah, he <laughs> says it's mine, but it's not. It's oh, his. he said it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he always says that, but yeah, it ain't. It's it ain't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> nice guitar, though. Yeah, it's uh, a really nice guitar. Is a nice guitar. You need it there. You need I to do need it. Or less it's, ball. It's important. It is important. Yeah. I mean, my, my voice broke, but it's important. Yeah. <laughs> Alex Davidson, thank you for your, your top chat. Really appreciate it. Came in late. We'll stream it later. Thanks, Keith and Company. Really appreciate you coming, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. How I get an AC-15 to sound a bit like a Fender. Don't want to buy another Fender right now. Hmm. My first reaction would be EQ pedal. Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, because uh, the thing the thing that's really great about AC-style amps or, or any uh, EL34-based Vox-style amplifier, I should 84, sorry, Vox-style amp, is they're very, very harmonically complex in the top end. They're gorgeous. But the, the mids tend to be, a, I'm not saying they're not mid present, but it's kind of a thinner mid. And then it's kind of a pillowy spread out low end. Um, what you're missing is, cause you could tame it by cutting uh, top end and brilliance, but what you're missing is, is the mids. So I would look at, yeah, just some sort of, I mean, you could, any, any EQ pedal would help to where you could just bump that, you know, 400, 800, one, somewhere, one K somewhere in there just to kind of give it that, that bell kind of bump. Yeah. Probably that's what I would do. Yeah. Um, if and then if that doesn't it, work, you know, there's an amazing, there's an amazing rig rundown that they did with Bukovac and Bukovac goes on about his six band. I think the guys at XTS have, have messed mm -hmm. with his, um, his six band to make the bands more guitar friendly. Mm -hmm. And he basically, he's like, I could, I could dial this 335 with my six band to sound like a Gretsch watch. And he reaches mm -hmm. down and he doot, 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 and he's like playing all of a sudden, you know, he's got a 6120 in his lap. And basically it, it said to me was you guys all should be spending way more time with your EQ pedals so that you could really change that quickly, that you, you could know what's happening. And you immediately, I mean, that's a studio guy. You immediately start citing frequencies. And yeah. That's, that's where we all should be working on, you know, understanding our gear at that kind of, uh, level of how it's affecting, you know, like take a box and move it towards a fender or there, those kinds of things. I actually always quick to say that you can, I don't have any trouble dialing a Vox, especially if it's got the mid control, like the VC 35 has, it's easier to get a Vox to sound like a fender than the other way around. Yeah. Because fenders are really difficult to get that crazy complex, like top boost thing. Yep. Um, and you, you know, there's probably pedals that you could use to kind of enhance that and bring it out. Um, you know, but yeah, I, I won't argue that with you. That's, yeah, that's correct. Yep. Uh, John Etoile says, Etoile says he has an 09 DGT. It's the first year with the finished fix. I think mine was an 09. The, the yeah. first one I had, it's the hollow bird year, either the dots or hollow birds was okay. the 09 to 10. And, and I asked David when I had him on the stream, what, what his favorite ones were. And he said the, the 10, the 2010 was when he thought they had it all sorted. And then again, he said, then the brand new ones, uh, he thinks yeah. the new ones are back to a lot of things. They've changed a lot of things that are back to like the first couple of years. Uh, so that's very cool. You see well, yeah. I, so, I mean, I don't want to get too much off the rails, but it, it was the DGT that actually made me take a look at PRS. Right. That was, yeah, that was the one that made me go, oh, PRS has always been around, but 
What's the deal with PRS? You know, it's that guitar for sure. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, Perry, my editor wants you to know, Sean, that you can borrow his Les Paul if you're ever short. He, he glad to lend you his Les Paul. Awesome. Yeah, can you send it down? Les Paul. <laughs> <laughs> it's a collector's choice, Les Paul. Oh, nice. So yeah, yeah. No, I he, mean, he's not in town. He's in Boston now. Uh, oh, <laughs> he wasn't well, that's all right. Town. So yeah. <laughs> everywhere ships, right? Everybody ships. See that box. <laughs> I could bring it out. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody on here is uh, from the 615 Erie Code, but I actually am planning a trip out um, to Nashville for a vacation and get to be in the room with people like Sean, who I've worked with a number of times, but I've never had the pleasure of being in the room with. Um, and so I'm going to be out there and I might get some people together uh, out in Franklin because I'll be sitting out in Franklin uh, while I'm there. Yeah, uh, yeah so. that's that's uh, that sounds like trouble. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Especially when you think about the cast of characters that that little part yeah. would generate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I'd ask for questions uh, here at the end, folks, but I'm scrolling back through the list looking for things. People seem to understand I uh, was just on a roll. Oh, Perry's reminding us that the pedal I couldn't remember from Rocket was the Majesty. Oh. And you did have one on your board. You said it was alternating uh, with the 45. You mean, the, uh, you mean the Majestic. Majestic. Right, 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 yeah. right. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great pedal because that one's, that one's hard to – like pinned down because huh. it is sort of to me like a JTM 45, but it's not, you know, that's, that's been one of my favorite. I just kind of bonded with that pedal and there's guys that don't like it. There's guys that, that'll put it next to another pedal and be like, ah, it's just, I don't know. It just seems flat to me compared yeah. to this one. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was the majestic. The majestic is fabulous. That's a really good pedal. I think that's, I think that, I saw an interview with David and Chris Van Tassel from, uh, and they were, <laughs> it was funny because you could tell, here's this guy with a new uh, name on his pedal. And he's like, yeah, it's like a blue note and a dude. And, and Chris is like, it's more like a blue note and a majestic and a clon. You know, it's like, <laughs> his, yeah. Mark's like, it's not what I thought it was. He's like, I love it. <laughs> it's not what I thought it was. It's great. It's like the designer and the user, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Very Mark's probably like me. It's like, if, if I don't like the way it sounds, I don't care what's in it. If I love the way it sounds, I don't care what's in it. I don't care. <laughs> great, great. Like you said. So. All right. Let's see here. Oh, somebody gave a love Uncle Larry for the Bukovac reference. Of course. Of yeah, course. Um, yeah. Nobody. There's there's nobody but Tom that is like Tom. That guy's awesome. Yeah. Um, actually, you know, I would be remiss. Uh, Perry has got one of the new Universal Audio uh, little deluxe pedals. And he can't stop raving about it. He just says yeah. it sounds incredible um, through his monitor. He's got a pair of Atom monitors mm -hmm. and he's like finds himself practicing with his pedal board right into that, right into his, his DAW. Just, he just thinks they're amazing. And he's been bugging them to do a, a Marshall version. Immediately started to write to them and say, you guys need to do one of these, you know, because mm -hmm. I think that's um, uh, Santiago that yeah, did that. James. James. Yeah. I mean, and his, his reputation, you know, precedes him sort of absolutely the guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the thing I always tell people, you know, when they've got, you know, critiques for anything that James has done, it's like, are you really honestly <laughs> going to argue with those years and his right. knowledge? Right. Just and, just go back and watch the series of Eric Johnson videos he made yeah. and just your attitude. That's all you yeah. need. Yeah. yeah. Right. The, the rabbit yeah. hole of fuzz face videos and stuff that he oh, made. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 So great. Well, we are out of the, out of time here. I want to thank everybody for being here. I really, Sean, I really appreciate it. I'm glad we were able to work this out. Oh man. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah. It was kind of we short notice, but man, made very, it happen. Very short notice. Extraordinarily short notice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate you being here. I'm going to, I'm going to have um, Sean play us out by playing the intro again. See, I scared you, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's going to sound weird. <laughs> That's a moment. So let's talk about short notice. Now I'm going to play the intro again as a way to close us out. And uh, again, thanks for everybody for being here and uh, click the like button on your way out. Um, take a minute to look at the store, look at the stomp preset pack, buy a t-shirt, et cetera, et cetera. Go and watch Sean's channel. Sean's got great stuff there. I would say it's funny, you know, Ryan Bruce, my friend fluff that does riffs, beers and gear. Um, he interviewed me at one point and somebody, or somebody was interviewing him. He's like, you know, I actually don't watch a lot of guitar channels. 
but I watch Sean's. I watch Sean's and I could name it. Like on one hand, I could do the channels that I watch every time a video comes out. I always watch yours. I watch the boys from Rev. So uh, everybody should do that if you're not already. Um, the videos are great. And frankly, um, you, you might you might go quickly past a demo of a piece of gear. But the thing that I played on the intro and the thing I'm going to play on the outro is a demo, is a tune that Sean wrote for a demo years ago. And I've, I told him, I go back to it every, I don't know, every year, every six months. I go, what, what was that tune? He's doing yeah. that weird pedal steel stuff. I got to go yeah. watch it again. So everybody should go look at that Rocket Alien Echo to get yeah. the whole video where he's demoing that pedal because the tune was just, it was inspired. Yeah, that was early on. Actually, not to bring things down, I won't because I know you're running out of time, but uh, okay. that song is actually called Phase Song. And it's actually a song I wrote for my grandmother. She passed away. And I went ahead and I, I thought, you know, I'll go ahead and do it. You know, this will be cool. But that's, yeah, that was, that was heavy. Like when I heard that, I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I've mentioned that to you before. Yeah, you have. Yeah. I have. I've gone off about that before. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to take us there folks. Thanks again. Thanks to BV for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm glad he got his stuff sorted out again. Thanks everybody. And make sure you enjoy everybody. Um, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. See you guys.